This is the sort of video I make when I'm trapped inside all day. At least I get to talk about it with Jose. As I speak, we're in the midst of a global pandemic where everyone is trying to quarantine themselves away from the infectious world around them. While I'm not going to present myself as someone nearly knowledgeable enough to speak as an authority on how society should be handling this moment, I want to talk about how some even less qualified people are using it to spread their fascist propaganda. Reactionaries of many stripes have been crowing quite a bit about borders lately, particularly since various nations are self-quarantining in the face of a global pandemic. This somehow vindicates their long calls for closing borders. Of course, closing borders during a pandemic isn't the same as stopping mass migration, which is what they're always complaining about, but that's not stopping them from offering the only solution they ever have in a crisis. Paul Joseph Watson gives us an example in his video, Idiots React to Coronavirus. I think has a typo in it, that S should probably be behind reacts. Anyway, here's the clip. The irony of singing a song about open borders after a disease has killed thousands of people because of open borders. And in C-O-R-O-N-A-V-I-R-U-S sick face emoji, he has a similar take. Russia, which closed its entire 2,600 mile border back in January. Just 20 coronavirus cases, most of which were Russians returning from Italy. Most of the victims have already recovered. Zero deaths. No pandemic in Russia. Strong border controls. Minimal coronavirus cases. What's most obnoxious about these clips is the smugness dripping out of Watson. But why does he feel like he can be so smug? Since when has Paul ever spoken about the spread of a pandemic? We get a better understanding of the smugness from the even more smug Stefan Molyneux in his video, Coronavirus Update with Stefan Molyneux, Borders Closed! I guess the world leaders have given up on the mainstream media and now they're listening to alternative media. And that may be the salvation of hundreds of thousands of people. And that is a very, very powerful thing. And I'm pleased and I'm proud to have done my part in helping to save thousands of lives, hundreds of thousands of lives, potentially millions around the world, not a bad couple of weeks' work. People in Canada, people in the West, have been desperate to close their borders for 20 years. More, really, 30 years or so. And it's here we understand what the project really looks like. The pandemic is being used to foment the same anti-immigrant sentiment these folks have always been using. They want us to pair the feeling of safety you might get with temporary border closures with closing borders to immigration. Here's some telling anecdotes Paul Joseph Watson uses in his social distancing hand emoji video. Mark D. Levine, chair of New York City Council Health Committee, lauded how huge crowds gathering in New York City's Chinatown was a powerful show of defiance of the coronavirus scare, tweeting four images of large groups of people gathered to celebrate the occasion. Most of the attendees were Chinese and some of them had almost certainly recently returned from China. And he conflates the movement of people with social distancing. According to top Italian virologist Dr. Giorgio Palou, Italy's left-wing government refused to isolate people coming in from China because it was seen as, quote, racist. That's not social distancing. Of course, it's important to note that immigration is not the same thing as social distancing. Social distancing refers to the distance we keep between individual people on a daily basis. Whether or not that person is an immigrant is irrelevant because turns out the virus doesn't actually care what your ethnicity is. Paul Joseph Watson does not want you to notice the misdirection he's using here. He wants you to think of immigrants specifically and especially being carriers of the virus. One thing I'd like to untangle here is that when a nation state closes its borders, that this is an effective way of stopping a pandemic. Even if you're someone who generally likes immigration, you may still be under that impression that keeping infected people out of your country during a global pandemic is a good thing. For instance, Watson and Molyneux both talk about how it's been so effective for Russia, so we should be taking their lead on this. The truth is it's a bit more complicated than that. According to the World Health Organization, closing international borders in the midst of a global pandemic has a limited impact and can possibly do more harm to a nation by limiting trade, particularly for nations that rely on exporting their goods to keep their economy afloat. Various mathematical models suggest that isolation only delays the inevitable spread of a disease, and that other strategies, like self-quarantining and stronger healthcare services, are more effective. 
And we can look at the Russia example right now. Watson and Molyneux were talking about how closing down the borders was going to save Russia from this incoming pandemic. But it turns out the mathematical models used by the World Health Organization were much better predictors. And we can see, sadly, that COVID has started to rise very rapidly within Russia. Turns out viruses don't necessarily stop at borders. So why do nation states close their borders? In an article for Foreign Policy, Dr. Mara Pillinger suggests the reason they do this isn't because they're effective on their face, but rather they signal to the population that the government is taking extreme measures to control the situation. And it's understandable that in a time like this, people want to think that their government has things under control. But there are more important steps that need to be taken, like providing health care for citizens, coordinating with scientists around the world to work on treatments. There are, of course, benefits to restricting travel, especially when it comes to social distancing and the dangers of having people crowded into buses or airplanes. And the role borders play when it comes to the spread of a disease during a pandemic is an interesting and important discussion. But that's not what we're talking about in these videos. We're not getting a fact-based argument about border control from these guys. What we're seeing is the scapegoating of immigrants and non-white populations. Immigrants are not responsible for the spread of COVID-19. This shouldn't need to be said, but considering the people we're talking about here, it shouldn't be surprising that immigrants are once again presented as a scapegoat. Let me go back to this clip for a second. Most of the attendees were Chinese, and some of them had almost certainly recently returned from China. What is Paul Joseph Watson talking about here? How does he know anyone in this crowd was recently in China? And if they were in China, how does he know what they were exposed to? Why is he just assuming that anyone Chinese is a potential virus vector? These people could very well have been born in the US, or they could have been living there for years. Maybe none of them have been back to China for decades. I don't know, and the important thing is, neither does he. To assume that Chinese people are inherently more dangerous is... Well, it's a racist assumption. And for God's sake, can we focus on what matters? We're fighting a deadly global pandemic. Can we just shut up about racism for five fucking minutes? Maybe he could help us out by being less racist. If he were criticizing the actions of the Chinese government, that would be fine. There's plenty of criticism to be done on that side. But he would sooner put it on the Chinese people themselves, portraying everyone who's Chinese or of Chinese descent as a potential threat. Paul Joseph Watson and Stefan Molyneux are part of a project to demonize people of color. For all the talk you might have heard of Asian immigrants being preferable to immigrants from Africa or the Middle East, the second they think they have a plausible excuse, this minority group is going under the bus just as quickly. This pandemic will be used to justify portraying people of Asian descent as dangerous and disease-ridden, all in an effort to create what every fascist wants, an ethnostate. And we can see some of this anti-Chinese and, more broadly, anti-East Asian sentiment manifesting itself right now. The FBI has warned of a possible surge in hate crimes in the US, and in Canada there have been increased reports of Canadians of Southeast Asian descent facing discrimination. Here are some words from Cynthia Choi, the co-executive director of Chinese for Affirmative Action. Uh, we are very, very concerned in the Asian American community that this will have a lasting impact. We have yet to understand the full extent of what it will mean to come out on the other side, we don't think that um, the anti-Asian sentiment that we're seeing now is going to go away. And we're going to need to address that as a society. And make no mistake, using terms like Chinese virus and the fixation of Chinese people as a threat is part of a long-term game. We've been hearing echoes of this from the exact same commentators for years. Here's another Paul Joseph Watson clip. This is from December of 2019, titled, Diversity is Our Strength. Now, I haven't quite been able to put my finger on it, but could there be some kind of connection between the relative safety of these countries and the kind of people who live there? But who needs safety when you can have diversity? I know which one I'd choose. Diversity. Who needs actual borders when you can just have internal diversity barriers? It's a simple video with a simple message. There need to be fewer people of color in Europe and North America. Previously, this was largely about Muslim immigrants and refugees, capitalizing on the increase in anti-Muslim sentiment after September 11th. And I think this makes clear what the fascist playbook looks like, because they really only have one go-to move, and that's scapegoating minority groups. One thing you'll note from extremists like Watson and Molyneux is that they're quite ready to criticize politicians on the left, but are far more reluctant to call out politicians on the right. For example, when Watson says, Now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying this isn't a big deal. And the people who say it's just the flu are obviously downplaying the severity of the true threat. 
you'd think it would be followed by a clip like this. This is a flu. This is like a flu. Well, if you're familiar with Paul Joseph Watson, you probably wouldn't expect him to do something like that. Instead, he would rather lambast politicians on the left. The reason for this is because these far-right figures are more likely to find support in mainstream conservatism. Here are some examples of Tucker Carlson talking about the dangers of immigration and open borders. Get rid of ICE, accept most refugees, give citizenship to tens of millions of people here illegally. In other words, open borders. The idea of closing borders is already popular on the right, although in that case, it's using immigrants as scapegoats for economic hardship. The far right piggybacks on this exact same strategy, using immigrants as scapegoats for, well, pretty much everything. Watson and Molyneux are clearly afraid of angering the right wing audience, but they're still playing them. They're exploiting this crisis, comforting their audience to assure them that their beloved right wing politicians have no responsibility for their government's poor response, when really, politicians of all stripes have failed to one degree or another. The mission of these two is to target politicians who would be greater obstacles for their far-right agenda. We can see this in some of the rhetoric used by the likes of Watson. Here's an example of how he ties immigration directly to the pandemic and tries to imply his stance is a more authentic vision of conservatism. Panic, say all the big city LA and New York conservatives who are panicking because their favorite lobster restaurants are closing and they can't cook. These are the same conservatives who quietly support mass immigration because they need cheap foreign labor ethnic minorities to prepare all their food. We see this approach to other problems as well. To a fascist, there is no crisis in the world that isn't solvable by demonizing ethnic minorities. We can see that with the slow rise of eco-fascism, where elements of the far right are adopting the rhetoric of environmentalists to spread their fascism. Naomi Klein spoke about this back in September of 2019. I think the only thing scarier than uh, a far right racist movement that denies the reality of climate change is a far right racist movement that doesn't deny the reality of climate change. That actually says this is happening, there are going to be mil many millions of people on the move. Um, and we are going to use this abhorrent ideology that ranks the relative value of human life, that puts white Christians at the top of the hierarchy, that animalizes and otherizes everyone else, as the justification for allowing those people to die. The same global response we need to combat climate change is the same one we need to respond to the pandemic. And some of the rhetoric used about this pandemic is already proving to be quite dangerous and ready for exploitation by fascists, such as comments claiming that humanity is the virus. Now call me a radical if you must, but I am pro-human. That's right, pro-human. And maybe this is just the dreamer in me, but I think humans can live on this planet in a way that doesn't destroy it. What's worse about this rhetoric is that it's not very difficult for a fascist to swoop in and say, yes, humans are the problem, but let's just rephrase that. Not all humans, surely, just the wrong kinds of humans, the ones you perhaps don't want to be living next to. If you're one of those people who thinks humanity is the virus, you might even lean in a little more. Hmm, tell me more. And that's the trap fascists use. So we need to be very careful in the strategies we use to fight pandemics and all sorts of other struggles. We can stop a pandemic by working together to limit its spread and ensure that the most vulnerable have access to care. And we can stop climate change by reducing emissions and helping those most harmed by its effects. These are problems that require a number of different approaches and all of us cooperating together. Those of us who would sooner divide us into tribes to war against one another so they can create their little fiefdoms aren't worth listening to. Those are the voices dragging us backwards. Much in the way conservatives only have the one joke about gender they use over and over to attack trans people. Look, here's Ben Shapiro doing a version of it. Good one, Ben. Fascists only have one solution to real-world problems. Whether it's income inequality, climate change, terrorism, or a global pandemic, they always blame immigrants, they always blame ethnic minorities, and they always find the most vulnerable groups to scapegoat. Because they actually don't care about solving these problems. Their goal is to create an ethnostate, and that starts by getting rid of all the people they consider undesirable. We face a number of problems today, and they require a number of different solutions, and they require us to work together as a global community. We can't stop a pandemic one nation at a time, the same way we can't stop any of these other real challenges we face as a species without working together. Jose, you might be asking, what are these solutions you speak of? When it comes to pandemics, listen to medical professionals rather than pundits and politicians when it comes to your own personal health care. 
and as for political solutions, demand better access to health care. When it comes to relief packages, voice your support for those that help marginalized communities and workers and people uniquely affected by this pandemic. And more importantly, while we're all inside, talking to one another from around the world, let's try and realize that we're all in this together. That these movements we want to create are ones that need to be truly global. At the end of the day, we need to be united. Even if we could create our beautiful utopia here in this little patch of land we call Canada, it would mean nothing to me if the rest of the world was suffering and miserable. So this video was a bit of a surprise. I cooked it together pretty quickly. It's something I've been looking at for the last couple of weeks, and I kind of want to just say something quick about it. I'm trying to make shorter videos because I think the long epics, as fun as they are, aren't the only thing people want to see on YouTube. So people like this one I'll, might make shorter commentary ones like this in the future. For those of you wondering, where is the sitcom video you spoke of? Wasn't that what you've been working on for the last few months? Yes. Yes, it is. And was. It's still coming. Turns out a uh, complication has arisen. It's going to take a little bit longer to come out than I expected. I hope to have it up for everyone to watch soon. When that will be, uh, I just don't know right now. But if you want to know, as soon as it's up, I highly recommend following me on Twitter where I will have updates. Or you can also become a patron because they'll be seeing it first. You'll also get their names in the credits, just like you see here. Uh, and all those, uh, and there's like another like theme song download thing. Yeah, that's there too, if you join my Patreon. I want to add though, it's a really difficult time right now for a lot of people. If you are someone who's facing some economic hardship, I want you to know I completely understand and I encourage you not to become a patron if you're in that situation. Please take care of yourself. I'm gonna be fine. I would hate to think someone was giving me any money and then struggling to put food on their table. That's money I just don't want in my pocket. If you do want to support this channel, there is a thing you can do for free. It's called hitting that like button, subscribing if you aren't already, ringing that bell, and leaving a lovely comment below. And before I leave, I'll give you one last thing, and that is my thank you for watching.